Hey, developers, you know that debate that we always have as developers where it's not the tabs versus spaces thing, but it's the whole, should you go straight to an endpoint, like the REST endpoint, the raw endpoint, or should you use some SDK that's provided to us? Tons of examples for this all around. Well, today in this episode, that's what Julie and I are gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the pros and the cons about using REST versus using SDKs. Hey there. Hey. <laughs> you can tell we're new to this, right? <laughs> yeah, we are new to this. We got the are button you... clicking down though. I'm doing good, how are we you do. doing? I'm doing just fine, I'm doing just fine today. So this is our fourth episode, I guess our first real topic or meat, meat and episode. potatoes. There we meat go. And potatoes. Good yeah. table stakes right here. Um, <laughs> This one, this topic, this one we want to talk about today uh, in this episode, episode four of the Cloud Dev Clarity show uh, is around the discussion around should you use a REST and go straight to a REST endpoint or should you use an SDK that is some sort of a wrapper to that endpoint? So yeah. I'm going to go with ladies first. Huh. I already know what your opinion on this is. So I I'm going to give well, some I was background. Gonna go first. I'm going to, no, I'm going to, I'm going to give background. I'm going to give background on my opinion and give you my opinion. I think it's, okay. it's probably obvious to most people that I might say SDK because I do co-maintain an SDK that right. does this very thing. Yeah. But I want to, I want to go to the backwards a little bit and say that I didn't always feel that way. Right. Um, when I, we talked about, you know, in the getting to know me episode that I helped, um, I co-wrote a, a library, sort of a little mini library for loading code into um, a content editor or a script editor web co part called the Widget Wrangler. Bob German and I did that together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, about doing that is we started writing all of our solutions for clients and, and whomever using JavaScript and sort of had abandoned um, server-side code. So no more add-in, you know, no add-in model in, the, well, add-ins, uh, client-side code, but you know what I'm getting at. We weren't doing right. any of that kind of work anymore. Sure. And so um, when I first started writing JavaScript and using the 2013 REST endpoints, I absolutely was all about writing my own. So I mm -hmm. had my own helper file that had, you know, all the, you know, the post, the get, you know, all of those things with different, um, with different strings for the, you know, you are you, the URLs that I used pretty regularly and managed, you know, what site collection you're in and how to change the site collection and all that kind of stuff I did all myself. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a while before I actually switched and tried PMPJS. Mm -hmm. And then eventually adopted it. So I think at this point, I am in general in the SDK camp, camp. but I would, yeah, yeah pro camp, but I'm going to caveat it to say that I'm really picky about it. Like mm -hmm. I want to know exactly what's inside of that SDK, how it works in general before I'm just going to blindly use it. Mm -hmm. So Yes, mostly, I think is my camp. That's, I mean, that's fair. And when, just for our viewers, when you say PMP JS, that is yeah. a, a JavaScript library, works both yep. server side it's, with Node or client side. That's and right. It is, it's written in TypeScript. It's, right. um, yeah, and well, it handles, well, I'm just saying, it's written yeah. in TypeScript. It handles all of the SharePoint REST endpoints as well as a chunk of endpoints to the Microsoft graph using sort of a, what we like to call the library internal, sort of a internal reusable mm. uh, pattern for making those calls, handling retries, um, you know, formatting headers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, okay. So yeah, and that, I mean, that's, that's fair. Do you have like, well, actually, you know, so, You've kind of just put your flag in the ground. So let me put my flag in the ground and then we can kind of go, we can go back and we can go back. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess like you generally, I, I don't want to say that it's an abs, I don't want to do an absolute and just say that, you know, I absolutely don't like this or I do like this. My default position on it though is that um, I do, uh, 
I do tend to, 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 to gravitate towards going straight to a raw rest endpoint than I do on using an SDK. Um, I've got a, there's a bunch of reasons why I don't particularly, why I try and stay away from an SDK. Mm -hmm. There's times where I will go to it because I'm, I wouldn't, I don't want to make an absolute statement because if you look at any of the projects that I do, um, you would see a pretty good mix between the two. Like, well, why do you do this instead of this? And why do you do this? I was wondering that. that. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. I'll be interested to hear some of that. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, Sorry. I generally want to go more with like the or a restful endpoint. So like taking your example, um, just a second ago and using like PMP JS to talk to the SharePoint restful endpoint or talk to the, the Microsoft graph, um, endpoint, which is also a rest endpoint. Um, I never use anything like that. I, I've, I've yep. never been a big fan of the CSOM, the client side object model, something we had legacy, uh, managed code thing that we had for talking yep. to the SharePoint rest endpoint. Um, I don't use the PMP JS, um, library as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the majority of the reason why I don't like doing it is because I don't like to take dependencies unless I absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's baggage associated with dependencies. Yes, there's things that you get with those dependencies. Mm -hmm. uh, like for example, like with you guys, you have uh, a way to simplify the initialization of it or being able to reuse the same context uh, multiple mm -hmm. times on the same page without having to go through multiple real initializations. Whereas if I wanted to do that, I would have to build up my own infrastructure to do that, to share as a singleton yep. Um, yep. across the page uh, right. or across multiple pages. Um, but I generally try and stay away from those dependencies. And I, I have multiple reasons for that, not just to avoid a dependency, but I think one of the reasons that I really dislike about it is mm -hmm. that I feel like I have to always, the major, not always, mm -hmm. stay away from absolute statements, but I find that more often than not, um, I that an SDK is an interpretation of someone else's rationalization of the same thing I'm trying to get to. And when it's a restful endpoint or a rest endpoint, they're going straight to it. There's no debate. That's how it works. Um, yeah. Yes. There's a lot of like helper stuff that can be added for it. You guys have like a caching model and stuff in it. Obviously yeah. I'm not going to have that, but I just find that I, I would, I prefer to have less of a dependency, um, a less of a, a dependency chain or minimize it as much as I can. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example of where that may, that maybe is a really good point. Like, um, <clears throat> uh, like we, uh, have switched from when we went from version two to version three of the library, we, uh, switched from using verbose in the, um, in the header to, um, and, and so the payload changed, you know what I mean? And so the parsing yeah, so of the payload changed. And I think there's metadata. You get data metadata. Thank you. Yep. And I think there's an argument to be made that, and and full disclosure, it's super easy to change that now mm -hmm. in the version three of the library. But still, the bigger point here is, you know, you have to have thought about it. And maybe if you're doing the calls in a more pure way and not using an SDK, you're going to be more thoughtful about what mm -hmm. you're doing. Like, mm -hmm. oh, my payload is huge. Maybe I want to think about how I've configured this, you know, header to make these calls. Or, you know, maybe I want to make sure I do a select. If that is sort of obfuscated away from you, you mm -hmm. may not think through what you're doing as well. So I'll give you that argument for sure. But I think if you, from my perspective, I do know what I'm doing. I do know how the library works very intimately. And so the fact that I can so quickly write great, big, huge pieces of code that do a lot of work with a short amount of code, you know what I mean? The code is still yeah. there. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm yeah. sort of saying the code I have to write is significantly less, especially when... I would say 95% of the work I do is like, okay, you know, create the library, create the columns, create the content types, uh, pull this data from here, grab that data from here, merge that data from there, add that thing, take that thing. You know what I mean? So I'm doing yeah. so much work that, that, that the, the ability to have something sort of take some of that away from me is really, especially just the extra calls, right? If I do, if I, um, if I request like the items from a list and what, and I await that result, that result's already going to be parsed for me into a JSON object. Yeah. 
that's kind of a win, you know? It, it is. That's a good example of the differences, right? So when I go, when you want to use like the Fetch API, yeah. the native in all browsers, or sorry, native in all reputable browsers, huh, not talking about you, <laughs> Um But even, even Kredge has it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that when you want to call a RESTful endpoint, you're going to get a response back. But then right when you get that response back and you want to go work with the data that was returned in the body, if it's JSON data, you have to call, you know, response.json, which is going to and be- And await that promise. Yeah. And await that promise as well, right? Until you get that data back. So it's whenever I go to get data, because I don't use something like PMP or some other library to get my data, sure. yep. it's always a double call. I'm making a call to the endpoint and wait for that promise to resolve. And then I'm waiting for the JSON call to resolve from that promise as well. It's something that, I mean, it's a, it's a pattern that I'm used to. Here's, so here- and I, What about and I, retriever logic? But go ahead. Oh, I got to build all that myself. Well, I, I'm saying, I, so that's yeah. like- I'd have to do all of that myself, which- For every yeah, single that's, call. Or that's a, you have to encapsulate it into some sort of class to handle it, to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it, I mean, and that's a classic, well, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess when it comes to Microsoft SDKs, you're going to get, you. Can, it depends on, yeah. or sorry, Microsoft endpoints, you could get throttled. And so- yeah, you can get throttled. You can get 500 internal server errors on the SharePoint yeah. endpoints a lot. Like you, mm -hmm. you need to be prepared for the fact that they're a little fragile sometimes and they're, they're not going to be, um, I mean, you know, they're up most of the time. I'm not saying they're like no. completely terrible, but you know, you have issues and you need to be able to handle them. So, so this is, and this, this is going to, uh, this is me trying to like shoot down the SDK argument. Okay. Okay. But one of the things that I see from, and this is not a personal attack. Don't worry. Don't feel oh, I'm not being attacked. Um, one of the things that I see from my students uh, that skip going to a, to the raw endpoint. And instead they go straight to just using some sort of an SDK or some sort of a wrap around it. Mm -hmm. um, for example, they use PMPJS. Mm -hmm. They will run into a problem Yes. And my first reaction to them or my first question back to them is go look at the network tab, client yep. side solution. Me so too. SharePoint framework developer, mm -hmm. go look at the network tab and go look at the underlying calling. Well, here's my, here's my call that I'm using with um, PMP JS. I'm going, yeah, I don't know that. I know the rest call, show me the actual rest call. And they show me, they show me the endpoint they're going to. I'm like, yeah, there's no site in there. There's, I don't know, you're not setting the site. Well, how am I supposed to set the site? Well, it's got to be in the URL right there. So it's either one of two things. You're either not holding the SDK right, or you've done, or the SDK has a bug in it because it's not actually sending the the yeah. site over to it, or you don't think, yeah, or the developers, like you're not, you, you don't really understand exactly how this is supposed to work. And they didn't. And I find that the majority of the time, that a lot of the times when they run into stuff, when things break, they're like, I don't know what yep. to do now. I'm lost. I'm like, oh. it's, I just, what, what am I supposed to do now? My car, my car GPS is dead. Like you're going to get a map out. I have no idea which way is North. Like, yeah. Uh, I, and again, I'm a hundred percent with you because I answer issues like that in the PMP repo Yeah, a lot. Um, you know, didn't find the right piece of documentation. Didn't understand how the library really worked. Um, and I'm going to go back to my original comment, which is to say, you know, if I'm going to take on using an SDK, I'm hoping that I'm going to have a pretty darn good idea of how it works under the covers before I take that dependency. Yeah. I mean, I have this conversation with people and my my more famous one was when Moment was the thing that's been replaced. It's deprecated. But, you know, like people would use Moment JS the library, excuse me, the JavaScript library to like do one date manipulation. So they take yeah. a dependency on a whole library just to do like one date string manipulation. I'm like, you do realize you can just write that one line of code, right? Yeah. <laughs> like that's or not, that's not undoable. I mean, if you're going to make an entire app that's based on date time uh, manipulation and multiple time zones and all, yeah. It gets confusing fast and having a library that sort of helps you make sure you do those things correct is a, quite honestly a godsend. Yeah. But but when you just take a dependency on something, you really have zero idea of how what it's doing, how it's doing it or anything else. You're going to end up in that position where you're having to learn. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say this and I say this all the time. I, I, that's what being a developer is all about. 
right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking offline about, you know, the fact that I'm learning something new right now and it's so painful, but it's also joyful. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, I haven't had to learn a new, you know, language slash library or slash pattern for doing something in a really long time. Yes, it's frustrating. Yes, I make dumb mistakes where I have strings that I copy pasted wrong or forgot to change or whatever and, and frustrate myself for hours. But I think there's a mentality issue that yeah. you're sort of addressing that's different from the actual issue, which is to say that if you're using an SDK and you don't understand how it works, knowing the path to reverse engineering and figuring out, okay, let me go look at the network tab and look at the calls because all this thing is doing for me is uh, abstracting away those calls. Let me see, is the call being made the way I think it should be made? You know, is it? Oh, okay, but the result is not what I expect. Okay, that could be with the library. Oh, I'm making the call, but it's not what I expect. You know what I mean? And like yeah. having that sort of mentality to troubleshoot and to, you know, versus the, well, it doesn't work. I give up, you know? I mean, that's, yeah. no, and that's, that's different. That yeah, that's totally fair. And I mean, I mean, if you're not, if you're a developer and you're not in the mindset of enjoying the process of learning and trying new things, kind of in the wrong business, I think. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I think so. One of the, I will say, so you, we talked a little bit about this in the intro or like teasing it up is like, when do I try and, uh, when would I avoid going straight to an endpoint? Or if you look at my code, you look at my projects, even though I default yeah. to the rest endpoints, when do I go with an SDK? Yeah, a couple really good examples. Um, I, I'm generally not a fan of the SDKs. I guess the ones that come from the Microsoft 365 group. So, like yeah. for example, I don't like I don't use the ones that come out of uh, anything that we have from for talking to SharePoint. It's nothing against PMPJS. It's just I know the REST endpoint. Like I can still get the same thing done, and I I don't. There's nothing that tells me that. I that convinces me why I should switch over and start using this. Because I, and I see the benefits that it would give me, but I'm like, I haven't, I haven't gotten to the point where I'm just like, that's going to help me on this project. Right. Um, same thing with like Microsoft graph. I can't, I, I'm not, I, I don't care for it because I don't like the uh, fluent based uh, way of, of building out a call. Yep. Um, I understand just, I, I, I think better with like the rest endpoint, but there are other ones that do make a lot of sense to me. Like for example, even though there is a RESTful endpoint for Azure Application Insights, I use the JavaScript SDK and the web SDK for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why? Because there's some stuff that it does that I don't have to think about. So if like, for example, it wraps up an entire session into what's called a correlation context. And so I can see that all of this stuff went with that one user while he was on the page or she was on the page. Yeah. Or I can see that when I use App Insights in the context of an Azure function, that the second the function spins up, I ask App Insights create a con create a correlation context, and now I want everything that happens with this execution of this function to be wrapped up inside that correlation context, so that when I go to debug something, I can see that everything about it. When my code, all I did when I wrote my code was, you know, trace this message or with these additional properties, but I don't have to worry about all the other stuff of um, things that it does to me. Like it has a concept of of a a letter that goes into an envelope and I'm always writing the letter, but I want additional things shoved in the letter and mm -hmm. some stuff written on the outside of the envelope with every bit of payload that I send. I don't want to do that in my, I don't want to do that in each one of my methods and everywhere I'm calling those, right. those tracing and tracking things. I want the library to do that for me. When I talk to a couple of the different, um, that, some of the Azure SDKs, they're going through a huge rational re-rationalization and rewrite of all the Azure SDKs right now. Yeah. And I find like, talking to things like storage blogs and queues and log analytics, they all leverage the Microsoft identity um, uh, package. Yeah, It makes it, there's things on like the authentication side where like, here's a good example, the, the Microsoft identity package, when you're working with it with node, it has this hierarchy of three different chains that it's going to go through to try and figure out the credentials that you want to use to take oh, it away yes. from, your, yeah. from your app. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I can start, and if the first thing it does is it tries to see, is there an environment variable like, right. or, or specific environment variables, like the name, the password, or the, yeah, the client like ID, security client secret. Key something or other yeah. file. Yeah, it, I can't think of the name of it, but yeah. So it tries to find it from that side. If it doesn't find yep. it there, then it's like, okay, are you logged in 
to your Azure account on via, using the stuff that we have in VS Code or Visual Studio. So if it doesn't find the environment variable, then it goes to that and it tries to use that. And even if it is there, it goes, you can fall back to another one. So mm -hmm. something like say in a, a, a string or password inside of some sort of a settings key. And then the next one is now we're going to rely on uh, like a federated or a managed uh, a MSI. Yeah. Uh, man yep. Service. <laughs> oh, I just, sorry. I just, I just got, I, got, I had the I just same got problem. A block. But a managed identity. Yeah. It's going to get, yeah, it's an MSI, but it's like a, it managed service identity, I think is what it's yes, called. Yes. I think Service so principle. But there's that identity where I can say, like, hey, it's running in my Azure function. Even though I'm testing it locally on my laptop, I've got, I'm logged in with VS Code or I'm logged in with the Azure command line interface. Yep. Use that as my credential. But hey, when you're running in the Azure function up in Azure, that function has has been added, granted a specific role using RBAC on the storage account. Right. And so it knows to grab the different credentials. So I don't have any credentials in my code because I'm using this one SDK. I could write right. all that stuff myself. Somebody did, but. I do like those. So that's oh. the, that was the other thing I was gonna kind of go back with is like, there are some of those identity libraries that when you're developing and you, we're talking about cloud services, they do make your life so much easier. I mean, that would be a, ton of code to have to write. So I it, don't know. It is. I mean, you know, I know that you know we're gonna talk about it at least in one of these episodes, if not a thousand of them, right. uh, is when we talk about MCEL and Microsoft authentication or Microsoft yep. ide um, identity, I should say Microsoft yep. identity. Yeah. But for me, like MCEL, like I can't stand the MCEL library, um, the Microsoft authentication library that Microsoft provides. Yes, ton of code in there that does a lot of stuff that supports all these different flows. But I'm like, if it's my project, I know how to go authenticate. I don't need to go through all that stuff. And some of the things that these different SDKs do, it's their own interpretation of how the authentication should work that I don't need, that I, I don't need to follow their interpretation because it works the same way across different platforms. So real world example, the Microsoft Identity supports the supports OAuth uh, OAuth two, and specifically mm -hmm. when you're doing an interactive login, you generally are going to use the auth code uh, OAuth flow to obtain an access token or to get an authorization code that you're going to use to get a, that you're going to get a uh, an access token. MSAL lets you set up all the configuration stuff like that to do that to to talk to Microsoft Identity to go through the authentication to get the the authorization code and then to use that to exchange that with the client ID in exchange for an access token and the secret right. in a, in, for an access token and delegated access token for the user. I recently built something to do to, to log in to Discord and Discord also uses OAuth2. It also uses the auth code flow, but because I understood the auth code flow, implementing the code to do that piece of cake for me, right? It was not very right. hard. It was very, it was surprisingly very little code, but had I done all of my authentication stuff using MCEL, I would have been like, well, where's the method that I call and pass this and this and this in? Because all that plumbing stuff that's in that black box of MCEL, I don't understand how that stuff works, but I do understand how the protocol works. And so when I did it over in Discord, I didn't have to figure out, well, how does this, how do I make this call over in Discord? Right. It's the same and thing. And that's, yeah. that's the trade-off though. That's the, I understand this pattern and I'm choosing this SDK because I do understand the pattern. I think mm -hmm. that this SDK implements it well. And I, I think that it will provide me a quicker way to get from A to Z, knowing that I know what code I'd have to write every single time. And I think that's the point. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I've never taken a shortcut. I have like, oh, I've got to do this one thing and I don't mm -hmm. really know how that works but this is like i could just do these three lines of code with this sdk and that piece would be done that might be good you know i'm not saying i've never done that i have but i'm mm -hmm. saying that if you're talking about an sdk that you're going to rely on on a regular basis to write your code you should understand it or understand what it's replacing for you or what it's doing for you and your example of authenticating and especially i mean i think this is different for depending on what you do for a living, right? Like if you are someone who is only authenticating against Microsoft stuff, whatever that might be, 
MCEL can always get you there. So it abstracting it and you not understanding it maybe is okay until yeah. the day you need to do something different. And so, you know, I think your experience is more that you work against a lot of different platforms that are not just the Microsoft platform and thereby you understanding that really well means you're like, well, I don't need that library to do something that's going to take me just this little time to do, right? And I think you, there's a lot of people who use it because that's hard and they want to get to writing the code and like, I don't don't really want to understand the black box, but I think that's dangerous. Like, um, that's my opinion. You well, but you bring up a good point. You actually you bring up a really good point because in that case, I think you bring up a really good point. The reason why I say it is because it, like you, I'm also coming at it from the perspective of an educator, of mm -hmm. someone who's trying to explain stuff to people and to and help them understand how stuff works. And so, yeah, I'm talking about different. I, I do you. I, I find that if you ask, the best way to learn something is to ask why. I, I hopefully five times, but mm. when you're learning it, but right. ideally as deep as you can get it, because the more that you can answer that why question every time you turn around, the world's not flat. Why? Because it's a circle. Why is it a right. circle? So yeah. All that kind of stuff. Well, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't I was just news to any of our listeners. <laughs> I'm sure there's some, well, it's a sphere. I know. I was um, I was assuming that the flat thing was kind of a. You know. <laughs> oh, okay, I gotcha. Two dimensions versus three. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Totally so I, uh, but um, there's that. But then, yeah, I agree with you that there are that if you're only doing, if you're only working with Salesforce, you only care about their authentication stuff, which OAuth two and blah blah blah. But they go to a different authority, whereas our authority in the Microsoft world is Microsoft Identity, which a lot of us refer to as Azure AD, but it's Microsoft identity. Right. So yeah, that's fair. That's totally fair. So. Doesn't mean guess, that it's always simple. I mean, if you, no. we're going to have probably a separate conversation on authentication. Yeah. <laughs> Margaritas. We'll, we'll schedule yeah. that one for late in the day. No um, kidding. But you know, it does, there's a lot of different flows to your point. So, you know, Whatever. I mean, we don't want to go down that road, but the SDKs no. can maybe make those things easier for you, but you still have to understand which one you want and why you want it. And so yeah. back to the original point, you really should know what you're do doing, why you're doing it before you just blindly start like copying code and pasting it in and hoping you're going to get the right token. You know what I yeah. mean? And, I, and you just, you have to, I, I hope that what we've been trying to put across in this episode is not, one is better than the other or one is worse than the other. It really, it's in the eye of the beholder. Right. I wanted to pre present the, I know I'm on one side, you're on the other side in terms of what, our, I guess what our general default positions are or how we first come at something. Right. But it's, you know, it's like sitting down at a restaurant. What are you going to go for first? Some people go for the entree. Some people go for the appetizer. Some of us are going for the drinks first. Well, and then that's going to help me make the next decision. And, right? and then you have the thing like, do I have the appetizer because it looks so good and skip dessert or do I have dinner entree and then have dessert because the desserts look so good? This is why you have to see the entire menu right at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and I yeah. think I mean, that's exactly the same, right? Anyway. It's like this. You just have to, what, what's your default position and at least have a, have an understanding of why you do it, why you're going at that thing, why yeah. you're going, why you're approaching it like that. I, I find people just sometimes will just start, grabbing everything and throwing at it. I want to do this and mix and match everything. And it's like, you need to kind of have at least have a pattern for why on how you approach stuff. It's not that your pattern is wrong or right, or that it's better than somebody else's or worse. Just like the restaurant example I gave a second ago, we're all going to look at stuff differently. It's, it's always kind of, it's one of those things you sit in a restaurant, you go with a bunch of people. It's like, watch how everybody else opens up their menu. How do they do it? Like, what are they doing first? Are they going, are they just first page and let's look at all those appetizers or yeah. it's flip it over. Let me see where your cocktails are. Or can I have the wine list? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So. Oh, it's exactly that. Yeah. Well, that was a really good discussion. I think we, we sort I of beat that dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, well, hopefully. Right. Yeah. So people, what did you think of this episode? Did you like it? Please let us know, drop a comment below uh, and uh, submit uh, a topic for discussion uh, in those comments. Uh, and if you really like this video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe by clicking on that nice red subscribe button. Uh, 
I'm <laughs> and, doing, I'm sorry. And you'll get, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm and, doing <laughs> so clearly, he's dangerous, people. He's dangerous. Damn, I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> sorry. So if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe by smashing the subscribe button. And then you'll get to know when we publish more Cloud Dev Clarity episodes for developers on the Microsoft 365 and Azure platforms. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>